Well, as you're seated, I want you to join me in uh, Psalm 67. And it really is great to be back from India. It's nice to be when, when you don't see the air. I know we missed that uh, when uh, you had the fires and stuff here. We were gone, but it's just so nice to be able to breathe. And I, I, even though we're jet lagged, and you talk to most of the folks on our team, the jet lag is very severe and real. Uh, we haven't been sleeping well since we got back. But the trip was a blessing. Everything about it was an overwhelming blessing from the Lord. He answered so many specific prayers in so many specific ways. And we thank you for praying for us. And you'll hear more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, Alan McDowell's putting together a video, a short video to summarize some of the things about the trip. But I just wanted to ask you a really simple question. Are you with me here so far? Are we blessed by God? I mean, truly, are we? Have you been blessed by God? I just think about that. Do you have life? Please say yes. <laughs> if you don't get that question right, we got a problem. You have life, you have breath. You have a measure of health. It doesn't matter what the measure is. Do you have a measure of health? Now, there may be some watching right now on our live stream, and they're not with us because their measure of health isn't as good as it used to be. But they, you, we all still have a measure of health to be able to watch, to listen, to participate. Do, do you have salvation? Do you have the Word of God? Do you have Jesus? I, we're blessed, aren't we? You have the Holy Spirit, the Heavenly Father. Think about this. We have prayer. We have music. Do you have spiritual gifts and abilities? We have so much. We have a place to live. You've got a bicycle or a car. You've got income. You've got medical insurance. Some of you have retirement plans. Some of you have a lot of savings. We have technology. I've got a couple pieces of technology here. I bought this one right before we went to India, and it was a good thing. Because right when we got there, my MacBook Pro died. And if I hadn't had this, I would have been preaching 13 messages from memory. And my memory ain't so good anymore. We have technology. We have so many things. We have children and grandchildren. We have an eternal inheritance. We have hope. We have assurance of eternal life. We have the fruit of the Spirit. We have a church. Look around you. You have a family here. You have God's grace. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Have we been blessed? So blessed. The Bible says every good thing comes down. Where? From the Father above. Every good thing. Every good thing in your life is a gift from God. You ever ask yourself why? Why has he chosen to bless you and me so profoundly? Why out of all the people in the world has he lavished this goodness upon us? Because not the whole world's not like this. We have so much more than so many. Have you ever asked, Lord, what do you want me to do with all these blessings? See, those are the questions that the psalmist answers for us in Psalm 67. And I want you to think through this very carefully because I think we're pretty casual about going through life with all of these blessings and rather than praising God for them and turning around and using them as a steward, we're typically complaining about what he hasn't blessed us with. And that needs to change. True worshipers know they've been blessed and they look to use those blessings for the glory of God. So as you're turning to Psalm 67, I want to give you a little background on this psalm. If there's a flow of psalms here. This is the second book of the psalms from Psalm 42 through 72. And Psalm 66 and 67 are not attributed to any specific author. Virtually every other one in this one since Psalm 50 have all been attributed to David. The only anonymous psalms prior to this are Psalms 1, 2, and 33. So all of a sudden we have anonymous psalms. We don't know who wrote them. We know they're inspired. The title says that it's for the choir director with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. What's that mean? Well, this psalm is for Steve, right? 
Steve's our choir director, our song leader, our worship director. This would have been in this contemporary situation for Steve. This is for the choir director. Why? So he can lead everybody else to this place. This is to give the choir director the right content to direct the worship of the people of God. And the pronouns tell us how he leads the worship. Now, when you read the Bible, read it carefully. If you look at verse 1, he directs his message to the worshipers. Now, it looks like a prayer to God, and it is, but it's instructing the worshipers to pray this prayer. He uses a third-person pronoun, his face, when he speaks of God. He doesn't say you or thou, he says his face. So in verse one, he's talking to the congregation, challenging them to join in on what he, he says in this verse. But then he switches. And in verses two through five, he changes to second person referring to God, you or your. So first he's talking to the congregation, then he's talking directly to God. Then when you get down to verses six and seven, he comes back to the worshipers and God is third person again. This is the way he leads. And it made me think about the book we just finished in the book of Ephesians. Remember in chapter 5, he said, When believers are spirit-filled, they will admonish one another. They will sing to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with their heart to the Lord. They're singing to each other, and they're singing to the Lord. There's mutual edification and instruction during worship. Not just the preaching time, the singing time. This is a song, and the first verse is challenging the congregation. The next four verses are upward to God, and the last two verses challenge the congregation again. It's almost like there's an introduction, some explanation, and then a conclusion and application. I just want you to see this with me and how profound this is. The content is vital truth that believers need to be reminded of constantly, and corporate worship is the best place for that. Why do we take the time together? Why do people in India take an entire Sunday? Why do we get this hour or so that we have together? It's because we need it. We need to be reminded of these things. We need to be challenged in these things that we might live them as true worshipers. Now, most scholars believe this psalm is in the setting of the harvest season. In fact, they believe that it was specifically written to tie into the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, Pentecost is 50 days after the festival of unleavened bread, the Passover. 50 days later, you have this harvest. After seven weeks of harvest, they all gather together and they celebrate God's goodness and his provision. You see that in verse 6 where he says, The earth has yielded, perfect tense, has yielded and will continue to, its produce, God our God, what? blesses us. So by the time you get down to verse 6 and 7, it's God's blessing on us physically, monetarily, financially, whatever word you want to use there. It's the psalmist wanting his fellow worshipers to reflect on the physical blessings of God and respond appropriately. Then the psalmist points out it should be accompanied by stringed instruments. Well, that's pretty common anyway, because the word psalm itself means a song accompanied by stringed instruments. So all of the psalms were accompanied by some kind of an instrument, a harp or something. But I believe in here particularly, what he's trying to say is there's going to come a portion here, and you see that little word selah, S-E-L-A-H? You'll see that word twice in this psalm. And it's a word that refers to either a musical crescendo, where the whole focus of your psalm, your attention is drawn to that, or it's a musical interlude where you're supposed to stop, pause, reflect. Don't race on. Don't go, I know that. That's so familiar. So what? Let's move on. Come on, pastor. Let's get on. No, no. He says, slow down. Think about this. Let this sink in. This truth will change your life if you'll let it. This is what the psalm is all about. He then says it's a psalm, a song. A song, this word a song, is in the headings of Psalm 62 through 68, linking them together as a group. Psalm 65 through 68 all have harvest as a sub-theme. Now what's interesting is synagogues sometimes display Psalm 67. I think we have, it should be a menorah-looking thing. 
So if you go to a synagogue today and other parts of the world, you will see often somewhere in the synagogue this thing that looks like a menorah. That's actually Psalm 67, all seven verses in Hebrew, made to look like a menorah. The, the candelabra, the, the light of God, a reminder of God's provision, like what happened in the time of the Maccabees. You look at this and you're reminded that God blesses you. He provides for you, and he then wants you to be a shining light to the world. So you'll see this as you travel around the world. So I want you to do something with me. I want to put the words up now to Psalm 67 on the screen, and I want you to stand, and let's read this together. This is, this is really powerful truth that we need to grasp and apply. You already, this is the New American Standard, which uh, is really the best translation on planet Earth, by the way, just... <laughs> Let's read this together. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Thank you for reading that with me. Would you sit down? I, I want you to think about the structure of this. The psalmist put a structure to this psalm that if you had the Hebrew mindset, if you read the way they would read, if you understood the way they structured things, it would be impossible to miss the point. The structure is really clear. Verses 1 through 2 and 6 through 7 are parallel. Verses 3 and 5 are parallel. And verses 4 is the central focal point of the entire psalm. It's done that way purposefully. You'll see this often. They'll call this a chiastic construction or a parallel chiastic construction where you have these phrases that are duplicates of each other. So you'll see what's in the middle. And that middle point is what he wants you to take home. There is a passion that this psalmist has for something to happen, and it must happen worldwide. This is what he wants to see. And so as we look at this over the next few minutes, I want you to see that really what we have here, based on verse 1, when he is first challenging the congregation to be aware of this one statement, what we have here is a divine interpretation of the ironic blessing in number six. You heard the ironic blessing in number six? We're going to look at it in a moment. This has been said over and over and over again worldwide. It has been heard by most Jewish people since childhood. When the, when the psalmist started this song, everybody would have recognized what he was saying. It would have been memorized by all of them. They thought they understood it, but they'd heard it so often that they missed its meaning. You know how that happens? This is how what religious people do. Religious people take something like the Lord's Prayer and think if they just recite the words over and over and over again, God's obligated to do something for them. They miss the point of the text. It's not a religious thing. There is profound truth that we must understand here. So the psalmist gives an exposition of a famous verse that they would all know. And the more they sing and meditate on it, the more they'll apply its truths to their lives. Many commentators call this the missionary psalm. And that's why I've chosen it. I do want to go through some psalms while we're in an interlude between a, a books of the Bible. We just spent a long time in Ephesians, and I love the psalms. But I want you to see with me the intended meaning of the ironic blessing. So let's take a look, and on, you don't have an outline in front of you because I had a crazy week, but I have an outline now. So number one, the prayer of true worshipers in verses one and two. Again, directed at the people. That should be another slide. The prayer of true worshipers. There's going to be what and then why. What, listen to verse one, God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. As I said, this would be familiar. 
Some would broadly smile. Yeah, I love that verse. Pastor, a song leader, thanks so much. Others would yawn. Oh, heard that one before. Come on, move on. Let's get to something I don't know. To their own, their own demise. But their minds would all go back to number six. So let me read for you number six, 22 through 27. Here, God speaks to Moses So Moses will speak to Aaron and his sons. So they will do this continually throughout the history of Israel. Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. Then we have our verse. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Then it goes on. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. God says, Moses, this is the way I want you to worship. Whenever you gather together, I want Aaron and his sons, the priests, to bless the people with this. And these were pronounced regularly. We see this in Psalm 4 and 31 and Psalm 80 and Psalm 119. See, it's the idea of God's favor. He's smiling on you. Do you ever think about God that way? You're walking in obedience and he is just happy as he can be. You're not answering me. Do you ever think of God that way? That he's just going, angels, look at that. Look at my kids. Look at them, they get it. What a blessing. God smiles. He's happy. He's satisfied. It was repeated every day at the close of the evening sacrifices in the tabernacle. And as Israelites spread all over the world, it was read at the end of every holy day. In synagogues, they would read it at the end of every service. Traditions say that the priest would make a specific hand gesture. So when they would quote this blessing, they would do a hand gesture. Well, many years ago, a young Jewish boy went to the high holy days, and he was with his grandfather, and he observed this being quoted, and and the priest would stick both hands out and do a specific hand gesture that went along with this. Their hands formed the Hebrew letter sheen. It's a a three-piece Hebrew letter, and the first letter of the word Shaddai, Almighty God, the all-sufficient one, the one who can meet all of your needs. So they put this hand gesture of this letter sheen to say to the people, as they pronounce the blessing, the God who is saying this to you is the Almighty He's all sufficient. He can provide for all your needs. Well, that young boy was impacted by that. And many years later, he moved to Hollywood and he got involved in television. And he was on a particular TV show. And they came to a point in this kind of fictional TV show of uh, this particular character that he had was supposed to come up with a hand gesture that would symbolize something really positive. And so Leonard Nimoy came up with this. The Vulcan gesture, live long and prosper. Because of what he learned in synagogue. The ironic blessing in number six has six phrases. You can move on from him now. He's kind of looking scary there. (laughs) But the psalmist here only quotes one of the six. Interesting. It's like reading a portion of the Lord's Prayer and then stopping. And you want him to keep going. And here's what he's doing. He quotes something familiar, and then he shocks their sensibility by showing them what it really means. In other words, they've misunderstood it for a long time. They've twisted Scripture. And the psalmist wants to correct their theology so they they can become true worshipers. So he says, God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. A shining face, a favor, acceptance, and love. What's the opposite of a face that makes you feel really good? (sighs) Scowling. Or how about this? You know, talk to the hand, right? This is God saying, I love you, I accept you, my favor is upon you. What a gracious thing. R.C. Sproul said to be be supremely blessed of God is to be able to look at him face to face. 
This biblical blessing challenges our often shallow approach to blessings from God. We ask God for things like physical well-being and finances and partners. And God says, what I offer to you is me. You can have a relationship with me. It's a gracious free gift. Do you want it? Do you long for that more than anything else? And the psalmist is reminding the congregation that's the heart of a true worshiper. I want to reflect on God's grace. What's grace? Even in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the Messiah. Even in the Old Testament, they understood it was God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm going to receive God's infinite, eternal blessings because somebody else is going to pay the price. They saw that in Genesis 3, when God sacrificed an animal to clothe Adam and Eve. They saw that in His promise when He confronted the serpent and said, hey, you're going to bruise him on the heel, but he's going to crush your head. There's a promise coming of a, a seed of the woman who was going to bring salvation to all mankind. They saw that in Genesis 12 when God spoke to Abram and later named him Abraham. But he calls to Abram and he says, Abram, in you all the nations of the earth will be what? Blessed. There's a blessing coming through one of your descendants, Abram. In fact, the book of Galatians 3.16 even makes it clear that when God said that in Genesis 22.18, he spoke of a seed, singular. There is a seed of yours, Abram, who's going to come down through the line, and he's going to do something that will provide gracious blessing to the whole world. Can you believe it? Mind-boggling. How? How could God smile at me? What should happen, you read verse 1, you should just say, I don't deserve this. What I deserve is cursing, not blessing. I've read Numbers. I've read Deuteronomy. I know what I deserve. But I sit here blessed. I sit here with a smile of God on me. How is that possible? Because the one who deserved blessing, the one whom the Father said in Matthew 17, 5, this is my, what, beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I smile on Him. Why? He's perfect. He does everything I said. He is absolute righteousness. When I look at Him, He deserves blessing. But what did He do? Galatians says he went to the cross to become a curse for us. The curse of God, all God's wrath was poured out on him on the cross so we could through him receive the blessing. You see, the son deserved God's shining face, but God turned away to the point that the son had to say, why have you forsaken? For all eternity, I've had your smile, and now it's gone. He did that for you and me. That's what the psalmist wants him to grasp in verse 1. He doesn't want him just to know about it. He wants him to experience it. Put it to music. Slow down. Change. Change your thoughts, your attitudes, your words, your actions. Have your worldview be eternally altered by this one historical fact that God himself came down and experience the curse so you could be eternally blessed. Well, that ought to bring light and joy and gladness to your heart, shouldn't it? I mean, you are, God's smiling at you right now. You go, I don't understand how. I do understand how. It's because you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen? That's why you are blessed of God for no other reason. And then he says, Selah. Stringed instruments kick in here. Slow down, everybody. Let this sink in. As Steve said, not just when you first came to Christ, every single day after that, let the grace of God sink in. Think about it. Meditate on it. Preach it to yourself. This is what true worshipers pray for. The blessing of all blessings to be made right with God entirely by grace. 
Why? Why do I want that blessing? Verse 2, now he turns it into praise and a prayer. That your way, Lord, may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. It's not about us, Lord, it's about you. Indirectly, it's about us, right? We get the blessings, we get the benefit, but ultimately that blessing is supposed to be about God. The worshipers know to say about right now, as he says, verse 2, they go, hey, to their buddy, hey, what did he just say? Where's the rest of the blessing? Why did he stop? Where did that come from? I thought God blessed me for me. Don't be, at, don't be looking at me like you don't understand what I'm saying. Have you ever thought that? Boy, Lord, I'm sure glad you blessed me, and I'm going to spend every last bit of it on me, because I deserve it. Some of you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm going to go back to India. Hello? And we're going we're gonna to learn more. We'll take hours. This is the intent. Lord, why have you blessed me? Because I want the world to know me, is what God says. I want the world to know me. That's why I've blessed you. Think about that. I have poured out my grace on you. I've shined my face on you so the world will see the blessing you have. And he's talking to Israel now, national Israel, corporate Israel. He's speaking to us as a church. You, the unified church, all of you, I have blessed you so abundantly so that it'll cause jealousy on those outside. And they're going to look and go, I want what they have. Do your blessings shine out that way? Does the world, you're, no one's answering me. Is there, we've gone silent. Did the guys the last four weeks train you to not talk back? <laughs> Help me up here. Has God blessed you? Are you telling others about it? Are you telling, hey, I, you can't believe how God has blessed me. You can't believe this. The ways he has provided, the things he has done, the salvation he's given, the sealing of the Spirit, the profound life that I have, the joy in my heart, the fruit of the Spirit, the spouse he's given to me, the children, the children he's given me, right? <laughs> it's all a blessing. You got to see it. This is what he wants us to see. And so as we get to this, he wants the worshipers to understand you are not meant to be a blessing cul-de-sac. You're not. You're not a blessing sponge. You don't just soak it up and keep it to yourself. You are meant to be a conduit of God's blessing that the world might see you and want to know him. The priestly blessing was about God's people Israel and what he would do for them. But why he blessed them is what he talks about here. He says that God's way might be known. That's synonymous with salvation in verse 2. His way, his manner of dealing people, the way that God reaches people, the way salvation is made available. How have people who have ever been saved always been saved? This is when a lot of people might say, well, you know, pastor, in the Old Testament, they were saved by works. Not true. Every single person in the history of the world who has ever been saved have always been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. Period. The Old Testament saints looked forward to it and believed. The New Testament saints looked back upon it and believed. But that is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man. He wasn't just saying from his time forward, no man ever, from Adam and Eve on, ever came to saving faith, and never came to a relationship with God without Christ. And so here we have this blessing the psalmist is looking forward to. We've seen the promise, as I said, in Genesis 12 and Genesis 3 and all over. And every generation needs this wake-up call. As he did this, you could almost see, you know, the country was kind of like, oh boy, here comes the sermon again. Let me, what's on my grocery list? And what am I going to do after? And I got to go work out. You know, I haven't worked out much lately. And their minds are all wandering. And then he says something, oh, he, here we go again. And all of a sudden he says this, and they go, hold on, what, what did you say? It's a wake-up call. It's not about you. You hear what I just said? Well, the audacity of that preacher, tell me it's not about me. Clearly, he doesn't know how important I am. No, it's not about you. God did not bless you for you. He blessed you for his glory. 
He blessed you for the benefit of others. Stop being a sponge. Wake up. Smell the coffee. Get in alignment with God. This is his world's view. This is why you're still here. The reason you're not in heaven is he wants to work through you to bless all the nations that all the nations might someday come to know and worship and serve him like you do. That's what it's all about, bottom line. Amen? Get some response now. Good. We're getting there. God blesses us. Now watch this. For the sake of the nations. He uses the word peoples. You might be thinking that he's thinking, well, you know, you know the, the Jewish people that are doing well, he wants to bless you for the sake of the other Jewish people. No, no, what he's talking about here is the peoples, the non-Jewish people of the world. This is the great commission in the Old Testament. People understand there are lost nations out there. There's a lot of them. We were just in India. Do you know that in the 1.3 billion people in India, did that number wake you up? 1.3 billion people in India? There are over 2,000 unreached people groups, distinct from each other, with different languages, customs, and cultures, and no gospel witness at all. And the psalmist says, God has blessed you so that all the peoples could share in it. All of them. That's the extent. It's such an important extent. He repeats it in verse 3 and 5. But again, what he's doing here, and uh, they, they call that a pericope or a bracket when they do this in biblical terminology. They're bracketing this idea. We want how many of the people to praise you, O God? All of them. We want every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. That's our goal. That's our stated purpose. We're not going to rest until that happens. Lord, this is what we want about. We want your blessings in our lives and our corporate life to impact the whole world so that every nation has a chance to respond to the gospel. That's what we want. We want every Gentile reached. What's it look like if they're reached? That's verse 5. This is the focal point of the psalm. Look what he says. I mean, verse 4. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. What's the next word? Four. Important word. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For, in other words, the reason they're glad and singing for joy is what he's next about to say they agree with 100%. Now watch very carefully what he says. For you will, what? Judge the peoples with what? Uprightness, and you'll do what, the nations? Guide. Three things. The psalmist says, you will know people are genuine followers of Jesus Christ, not because they show up and sing a song, not because they smile and go, praise the Lord, or in Hindi, Jameseki. No, no, no. You will know it's genuine when they are glad and sing for joy because God is going to judge the world righteously. God's going to come back and sinful people are going to be judged. God's going to come back and the only people that are going to make it are those who know his son. God's going to come back in judgment and they're excited about that. They're saying, Lord, come quickly. Please come back. We're so tired of the sinful world. We're not a part of the sinful world. We're in this world and not of this world. We want you to come back. We want you to judge and we want you to judge righteously with equity. Nobody's going to get away with anything when you come back, Lord. How could I be excited about that? Could you honestly go up to people and ask for justice? Do you really want to get what you deserve? But he says, no, 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 Lord, I, I, I want you to come back. I want you to judge. I want it to be righteous judgment. And then I want you to guide or shepherd the nations. I want someday for this promised Messiah to come. And I want him to judge all sin and rule righteously and be my shepherd king like David was. David was chosen to be king. He went from the sheepfold to the throne. Isn't that something else? And he was a picture of the Messiah. The righteous ruler, the Lord of all who would shepherd you and true saved people long for Christ to come back and judge the nations and to rule with righteousness and they submit to his lordship. 
And the psalmist says, that's what we're about. We're about seeing that happen worldwide. And we won't rest until it does. Then he says, Selah. Think about it. What are the implications of that? What would have to happen for us as a church to truly participate in that? What would have to happen to my lifestyle for me to engage in that? That this isn't just a sideline. This is the passion of my life. This is what I live for. This is why I exist. Everything about me, every relationship, every gift, every ability is driven to see that day when every nation bows the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. When everyone is singing praises, because praise is so much better when more people join in, right? It is so much fun being in India, and, and I've been in Russia, I've been in Nepal, I've been in South America, all these places, and I'm hearing these people sing God's praises in languages I don't know. And it's a joy. You're not going to be cool. I don't think we're going to be speaking English in heaven, by the way. I, I think we're going to be foreigners. And we're going to have to learn. It might be Hebrew, I don't know. But can you imagine he's saying, Selah, let it sink in. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all of them, don't let one be left out. Now he wraps it up with the practical application in verse 6 and 7. The answered prayer for true worshipers. What? Verse 6. The earth has yielded its produce. God our God blesses us. Now wait a minute. He's gone from a spiritual thing about blessing and God shining upon us. Now he's coming back, obviously, to the harvest. And he's looking at the harvest that they've just brought in, and here they are at the festival of Pentecost, and they're celebrating God's physical provision. And he says, God, you have provided for us and blessed us physically. And that physical harvest leads to finances. Lord, we now have an abundance of income. We have abundance of money. We have abundance of food for the winter, the summer, the winter, and until next year. Lord, we are blessed Notice the possessive pronoun. Who did this? God, our God. Not the God. God, my God. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't just know about him. I know him. And he knows me. And he's blessed me. He's provided for me. He's given me more than I need. So what? Why? Why did God bless me materially and financially? Verse 7. God blesses us that, what? All the ends of the earth may fear him. This is the reason. You want to know, you want to know why you got a Christmas bonus? You want to know why you got a tax return? You want to know why you got a paycheck? You want to know why you got change in your pocket? You want to know why you've got the house you have? You want to know why you have the car you have? You want to know why you have the jewelry you have and the clothing you have? You want to know why you have food in your cupboards? You want to know why? So that God would work through your blessings to bless the world. That every nation now, not just sing, not just be glad, reverence Him. Submit to Him surrender to him as you've shown them how that's what it's about that's why god blesses you that's why you got a promotion at work when someone else didn't don't for a second believe you're better than they are you got what you got because god wanted you to have it somebody else got what they got because god wanted them to have it are you happy about that no don't lie to me come on <laughs> but you ought to be you ought to be desirous of them using that for the glory of god is this psalm speaking to you? It's challenging to me. I want my life to count. I want to take every blessing I have and say, it's a gift. I don't deserve this, Lord, but for some reason your face is smiling on me and you've lavished your blessings upon me. Here, my hands are open. What do you want me to do with it? It's about me a little bit, but it's not about me. It's really about you and your kingdom, and your glory. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. My life's about you because of what you've done. John Piper wrote this, as we'll conclude. 
Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal in missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions we simply aim to bring the nations into the white, hot enjoyment of God's glory. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples in the greatness of God. And it's happening as we speak. All around the world, hundreds of thousands of people. Missiologists say every day at least 100,000 people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know that more, more Islamic people have been saved in the last 20 years than in the previous time, all the way back to the 600s when they started? God is moving in this world, and he says, partner, come on, I'm blessing you so you can join in. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. So can I challenge you with this? Selah. Take some time today and slow down. Don't just listen to this and go, that was kind of a nice thing. See you later, Pastor. By the way, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. You owe it to me to at least listen, right? <laughs> slow down. Slow down. Does your lifestyle match what we've just described? Is it obvious? Is it joyful? Are you giving and sharing all the blessings you have with great joy because you long for that day when Revelation 5 and Revelation 7 says, and it's going to happen. Folks, this is going to happen. Nothing's going to stop this from happening because there's a day coming when every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue will be before the throne of Christ, bowing down and worshiping him. It's going to happen. Will God say to you in that day, well done, well done. You poured your life into this. Enjoy the fruit. How do you do that? Share the message. Go tell people about the way of God, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. There is no other way. That's it. Live the message. Demonstrate that you are saved, that you are a follower of Christ, that you do love him, that he is Lord of your life. You're submitting every area of your life to him gladly. And then share the financial and physical blessings you have. Open your heart. Open your home. Open your wallet. Open your life to say, Lord, I don't need this stuff. Somebody else does. I want the gospel to go out more than I want a cup of latte, something, frappioca, caramelized. I want people to know Jesus all over the world. Amen? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the patience of these folks. Thank you for the things we're learning together. Forgive us, Lord for thinking the blessings were for us only. Forgive us, Lord, for not realizing how you blessed us because you wanted us to bless the nations and reach them for Christ. Renew our commitment to this. Give us the passion of the psalmist. Cause us daily to evaluate how we're using all that we have to advance your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.